Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Sugar Handling in the Summer Heat. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few quick items and then introduce our speaker. First, if you look at your webinar panel, you'll see areas called chat and questions. We'll take questions at the end, but feel free to drop us a message there anytime, and uh, we'll get to it after the presentation. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Ray. Ray Smith has four decades of experience in operations and quality for the food processing industry, including sugar, beverage, bakery, snack, confectionery, and other food ingredient industries. 20 of those years dealt exclusively with sugar ingredient handling. In his role at ADF Engineering, Ray helps our clients of all sizes improve and expand their production environments that deal with sugar handling and other bulk ingredients. And with that, I will pass it over to Ray and let him get started. Go Very ahead, good. Ray. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time to check in with us. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be able to speak once again on one of my favorite topics, which is sugar. And uh, you know, it's per that particular time of the year where when people are handling bulk sugar, they tend to run into some of the, the biggest challenges over the year. And that tends to be mid to late summer, sometimes into the early fall. And uh, through the years of working with people uh, at their plants, working with our sugar plants as well, uh, we've come across a number of uh, those type of challenges and a number of solutions that have worked for uh, improving or the efficiency of handling sugar. And we thought it would be uh, be good to share with you folks today uh, some of those experiences and hopefully it'll make your operations run a little smoother. So, so this again, the, we're titled Solutions for Handling Sugar in the Summer Heat. We thought it would be timely here again. It's uh, mid-June. We're going to get ready to come into that that summer season. And so uh, a quick agenda rundown. First, before we start talking about solutions and the challenges, we want to understand a little bit about the nature of sugar, which is going to help us lead us into you know, why these solutions work for people. We're going to talk about optimizing bulk sugar flowability. Uh, the receiving and transfer methods. And then we're going to get into the specifics of some of the summer challenges that you could be facing and may have faced in the past and the solutions that we've implemented that have worked for others. A little bit about ADF and uh, our knowledge and experience with sugar and how we may be able to help you as well beyond this seminar or this webinar and then leave it open for any questions. So let's let's start off with understanding the nature of sugar itself and we're talking particularly granulated sugar and bulk sugar coming into your plants. So again let's talk a little bit about you know the nature of sugar itself so sucrose um, basically it's we call it sugar but it's it's sucrose its identity is defined as containing a minimum purity level of 99.85 that's the world standard to be able to something to be called sucrose and it's uh however sucrose in the united states uh, all of the sugar refineries sugar companies have gotten so good at uh refining their sugar they're actually getting it down to even a little bit better than world standards they're at 99.95 five percent purity so and pretty much anytime you're buying at least domestic sugar i can i can attest for you're looking at 99.95 percent so sugar as we all probably know it's 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 hygroscopic which basically it's a tendency to attract and absorb moisture i call it it's almost like a sponge if there's available moisture it wants to grab it and sugar itself and we're going to get into some more uh, details on this, but you know, granulated sugar is a very stable product microbiologically. It's low moisture, has low water activity, and we're again we're going to get into some of the details on that to define that. So moisture, uh, typically, uh, granulated sugar moisture has a maximum specification of 0.035 percent. It typically runs. If you're getting sugar in from a uh, one of the suppliers in this country, this usually be between between 0 0.015, 0 0.025%. Very rarely have I seen sugar approach the 0.035%. You start running into some issues when sugar is uh, is at that high of a moisture. Uh, moisture measure is a measure of uh, moisture on the surface of the crystal. It doesn't measure the bound moisture or moisture is inside of crystals. So when you get your COAs, you're looking at moisture, and that's how it's measured for everybody. That's the standard. It's really the moisture on the outside of that sugar, and that's important uh, as we get into a little bit further here as to why to understand that difference between the bound moisture and the moisture that you find actually trapped inside of the crystals. 
So as, as I said, it, moisture is, you know, microscopic, tends to absorb moisture. It, it really wants to grab onto available moisture. We've got the optimum range. Moisture measure is a measure, again, of the surface crystals. So you've got internal inside a crystal that doesn't get measured. So in each side of uh, each sugar crystal, there's sugar, there's moisture that's basically bound, physically bound inside that, that crystal. And then there's also bound moisture that's between the molecules of sugar itself. Um, and a lot of it is uh, results around water activity. And that's bound moisture that is uh, achieved when the sugar company is making your sugar and conditioning that sugar, basically allowing it to dry under conditions after it's been processed uh, to dry to allow that moisture that's available, that 0.15 to 0.015 to 0.025, to allow it to equally distribute throughout the mass so you don't have a wet spot and a dry spot. Or later, at such time, you have that moisture trying to migrate to equalize itself under the wrong conditions whereby then you can get some you can get some uh, problems with the clumping. So really when we're talking about conditioning the sugar, it's surface moisture and a drying process. Again, you see that range again. So granulation is uh is uh, important here. It's the measure of the sugar crystal sizes. Now, uh granulation is is always reported as a range um across a, a, a series of uh, different specifications or a different set of screens. You know, sugar crystals don't all grow exactly the same. Uh, sugar companies can manage sugar uh, crystal growth to a certain degree, but Mother Nature also has a huge hand in it. And at some point, by measuring, by controlling temperature and time, a sugar company can achieve a certain range of sugar crystals that later on have to be uh, mechanically separated to a degree to give you that specification range. Uh, and typically we're talking about fine granulated sugar here. You have the mean aperture, which is important in, in the granulation size. It can affect the co uh, coefficient of variation or CV, which we'll talk about. Uh, it can, that can affect the functionality in a finished product or a production of the finished product. Uh, coefficient of variation is another very important aspect of granulated sugar. As CVs begin to increase greater than 30, there's a tendency for the hard and lumpy sugar to take place. And uh, again, it becomes much more rapid as you start uh, approaching, you know, 30s, 32, 35. I've seen it as high as 48 and um, sugar clumping very rapidly in containers such as uh, rail cars or in silos as that starts to uh, increase. And again, we're going to talk a little bit more about the technical nature of CV. Again, the time for hard and lumpy to occur and finished uh, product shortens as CV increases. So a little bit more about granulation. Again, it's a measure of sugar crystal sizes. It's measured across a range. So it's not just one size crystal. Uh, it is across a range, and there's a series of screens that is reported in your specification or on your COA. Again, the specification is for a certain percentage of range of particular crystal sizes at specific uh, SIDS or the screens. So you're not going to say, okay, at, at the 40 screen, it's going to be X. It's going to be X to X plus 5. It's going to give you a range. And again, your specification is built upon that, and your supplier should be giving you that range and, and reporting that to you in their certificates of, uh, of analysis. Mean aperture. It's the uh, particle size. It's the hypothetical mesh aperture of a sieve, which allows 50% of the sugar to pass. There go, you know, thereby the mean part. And so, typically, on a fine granulated sugar, or a lot of people refer to it as extra fine granulated sugar, is really the same product. Is typically what you would expect. Is you know that that uh, number should be somewhere between 325 and 375 microns. Coefficient of variation which I have found in my last few years in the sugar business to be extremely important when it comes to sugar flowability and sugar uh, taking up in rail cars or vessels. The coefficient of variation of the CV is defined as the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. It shows the extent of variability in relation to the mean of the population. So in the past, most people really relied on the mean aperture. It's just uh, an, uh, the arithmetic absolute you know mean at 50%. Well, as we all know that you can have an average of 50% uh, 
but you you can have a, a wide range of plus or minus and still end up with the correct mean. So this takes into account not only having that mean at 50%, but narrowing down that range from that mean. And it's that variation that causes a lot of problems. Uh, and, and again, in vessels where sugar gets hard and lumpy. So very important. So all of these aspects are really important when you're taking a look at your sugar specification and how your supplier is uh, providing this product to you, taking a look at those COAs, making sure, particularly here in the summer months, that it's uh, sticking to the specification because that in itself can have a huge impact on the performance of sugar in your system and not only getting it unloaded, but once it gets into your system and you transferring it to your point of use. So controlling moisture-related aspects of bulk granulated sugar is key to flowability and storage functionality. So when we think we think about sugar and we think especially about the summertime, the biggest issue we really think about is moisture. Yes, humidity. It's depending on where you are in the United States, you know, if you're in, the, in your south, in the deep south, you tend to have a longer period of time where you have higher moistures for a more extended period of time as humidity. You, we also get it up. I'm, a, I'm out of Minneapolis, and I can tell you we get some pretty humid days up in this area as well, the Chicago area. So we're really when we're talking about summer and sugar, we're really talking about the relative humidity. And we're going to be getting into some details on everything that revolves around humidity. So, again, measure, you know, relative humidity, as you know, probably all know, Measure of uh, relative humidity and transfer air and headspace and storage environment is really important. And key here is is the optimum relative humidity conditions in storage, particularly in storage, is 50 to 60 percent. You know that your target is 55 percent relative humidity plus or minus 5 percent. Now that throws a lot of people off because the normal tendency is to think we want to get sugar as dry, as dry as possible because we all know that moisture affects sugar. It's that it's very hygroscopic, but as we'll talk about, getting it too dry can also cause your problems as well. So sugar wants to be held, maintained at that 55% RH. And again, that's that is actually the point at which when the sugar companies are making sugar and letting it condition for at least 72 hours, that's the conditions that they're striving at to enable that sugar's moisture in the mass to equilibrate appropriately throughout the entire mass and not clump up in their certain areas. And by retelling, uh, I'm sorry, by, um, by maintaining uh, these conditions as well, you're getting other benefits by controlling moisture and relative humidity. Again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, granulated sugar is a very stable product and one of the biggest enemies is moisture and once moisture occurs you start getting micro problems with sugar so it's a great way to uh, avoid getting micro uh, intrusion mold yeast uh, some bacteria is involved it's a uh, it's a high purity level through crystallization uh, you get uh, by low moisture low water activity again you're maintaining not only from a micro standpoint, but again, aiding in that flowability of the sugar so it will move uh, appropriately through your systems. Uh, just a point, you know, water activity uh, is, is a measure of available moisture uh, for, for, again, micro use. So the sugar's uh, A sub W or water activity is actually 0.622. Water activity where actual cell division will not occur. So absolutely is not enough to support life is 0 0.605. So you have a very, very tight range there where quite frankly, if you can get your sugar and maintain it to where it normally should be, you really are going to avoid having micro problems with your sugar. So again, a side benefit to your process, it doesn't necessarily, micro has nothing to do really with your, uh, your, your flowability of your sugar. But if you get wet spots, or uh, if you're not getting a nice equal distribution, you can develop some uh, micro issues, which again, in itself is, is a big problem. So again, these attributes make granulated sugar un, uh, unattractive to insects, it acts as a desiccant. The fact that it's such a low water activity, insects, if they do get involved with sugar, I've seen it before, uh, they don't typically invade sugar, but if they, if they actually get in there, what they call occasional invaders, Actually, the sugar is so dry because of the water activity, it actually acts as a desiccant, and it will kill insects. There have been studies done where insects have been introduced, and it doesn't take long uh, for that, uh, that sugar to actually 
pull the moisture out of those insects and kills insects. So again, another reason why we want to control moisture and uh, humidity. So I've talked about this a few times. So really what we're talking about with sugar and handling sugar, a lot of it and most of it comes down to well, we've always referred to as sugar, sugar flow ability. How can we get that sugar to move through the system everywhere from from the receiving vehicle, such as a rail car or a truck, through into your silo systems, into your stores, or directly into your point of use? How can that sugar move through the system uh, appropriately? And that's sugar flow ability. So again, the ability to efficiently move, transfer uh, all the bulk granulated sugar from the delivery vehicle to the receiving vessel. And that's where one of the first big issues come from is how do we get all the sugar that we paid for? It comes in, again, I'm gonna mention a rail car, a, a truck. How do we get it into our silos, into our storage facilities, or into our point of use such as ribbon men, uh, blenders or other hoppers? You wanna get all that sugar out of the vehicle that's delivered it to you. And that has everything to do with flowability. So as I mentioned, you know, it's uh, we're talking about bulk sugar here. So you've got a rail car, you've got a bulk truck. That's typically how bulk sugar is uh, is uh, delivered. You, you know, some people who get bulk sugar refer to it in super sacks. Pretty much, you don't have a problem getting you know 2,200 pounds, 2,000 pounds out of a super sack. It's when you get into these larger vehicles, rail cars can hold up to 220,000 pounds of sugar. Bulk trucks are 50,000 pounds of sugar. How do we get all that sugar out of those cars? particularly in the summer months. And uh, again, you've got mo uh, moisture, humidity working against you, but you want to get it all out of there. It's about flowability. So the transfer methods, let's just briefly talk about those. So you've got pneumatic is one of the major ways of transferring sugar. You have what they call dilute phase or dense phase. Those are uh, two different types of methods of moving sugar through a pneumatic process. Each phase is designed to minimize particle degradation You've got to be careful with pneumatics because again you can start breaking down sugar causing smaller crystal size which will tend to be more attractive to moisture and in most cases you know you're using either vacuum either a vacuum or to basically suck it out of a rail car for a lack of a technical term or positively assisted to push it out of a rail car um, those are different ways that pneumatics are used of course you've got mechanical methods you've got screw conveyors where you see you got a picture of a boot lift underneath a rail car where it's a gravity unload type system where the sugar drops down through a boot lift into a some type of a screw conveyor, possibly over to a bucket elevator, and out sometimes even onto belts. So that's a mechanical method of moving sugar. A little more uh, robust when it comes to moving sugar, particularly in the summertime. Each of us are typically kind of you know stuck with the systems that we have at our plants. Uh, again, pneumatics are a little tougher with moving that air and treating the air. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Where mechanical is not as much dependent on uh, the environmental conditions because you're you're mechanically moving that sugar. One other method that I spend very little time on there's pressure differential. Uh, there's not a lot of this out there, but it's another means of the way sugar is moved from, particularly rail cars, where you're pressurizing a rail car and pushing the sugar to the receiving storage destination. But again, so it's still using air, and again, very depending on environmental conditions for, for humidity. So let's talk about some of the uh, challenges we see in, in the summer here, and uh, offer up some solutions that, that I've been involved with over the last number of years that had worked in, in many places around the country that I've been. So really, the greatest summer challenge that affects sugar flow ability, as I've already mentioned, is humidity. That's really what we're seeing the difference in the summertime. It's not so much the heat. Sugar can handle quite a bit of heat, but it's really about the humidity. So, you know, so let's let's talk about a few things. So, humidity affects sugar in the in the, these following ways. The smaller the crystal size of sugar, the greater the probability of attracting and absorbing moisture. Larger crystals don't tend to uh, pick up moisture as much as smaller crystals. The relative humidity below 50%, which remember that range we talked about, 50 to 60%. If you start getting ranges 50% or lower, that'll start that'll promote caking in the sugar in a fairly short period of time. And as we all suspect and we all probably know, is that you start getting higher moistures, in this case above 60%, the higher you go, the more moisture you have present, 
which means you're going to start that sugar is going to start having more available moisture to kind of absorb like a sponge. Again, high moisture results in hard sugar. So you can either have some lumping or in some cases where it's severe, that sugar gets hard, as I always say, hard as a rock. And, uh, and there's no turning back once it gets that hard. Some lumping will break up in the transfer process. Uh, there's also type of lumping that's kind of a compression lumping, but it's not uh, associated with moisture or humidity. But uh, that sugar that picks up uh, a large amount of moisture will actually turn rock hard like a stone. And uh, it'll, it'll never, it, to the point where I've actually seen it damage equipment. Damage or fracturing of crystals. I mentioned that earlier about that moisture inside of crystals will release that internal moisture. If you if you are mishandling your sugar, again, if you have systems that are breaking up those sugar crystals or what they call fracturing, I always describe it as like you're taking the egg and you're breaking it open and allowing that moisture in the egg basically to go wherever it wants to within that mass of sugar. And typically it doesn't end well. It doesn't come out of that egg. It doesn't come out of that crystal and it'll be absorbed by the rest of the sugar uniformly. It'll cause hot spots or wet spots and eventually hard spots in the sugar. Another thing to think about is the longer sugar remains in your storage, particularly in the summertime, again, we're talking you know, probably early July through maybe the first part of August, uh, last part of September, the greater the risk of humidity absorption. So if you've got humidity in the air and your silos are not completely controlled, you are subject to humidity that's in the air. It just goes to, you know, just kind of common sense. The longer it sits in that storage, the greater the humidity absorption. Now, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. As I mentioned, the higher the CV, the greater the affinity for that sugar to want to attract moisture and humidity, which means, again, on those crystal sizes, you got quite the variation of crystal sizes. You want to be, try to get it more uniformly as possible. So you know, you're considering your specifications and your COAs from your suppliers. Again, you want to look at mean apertures, but you also really want to compare those to CV. So some of the solutions. You want to minimize the effects by limiting the introduction of moisture or humidity in the makeup air, air of uh, during unloading. So whether you're using air assist when you're unloading with a rail car or you're unloading trucks, people have found it to be very beneficial because uh, to use some type of dehumidified air in the unloading makeup air. So basically through a truck or through a system that you may have outside, you're pulling outside air and everybody should be doing this and then most people I've seen have. You've got a screen there to make sure you're keeping out any con air contaminants, but it really doesn't do anything about the moisture. So what you're doing is during that unloading process, you're sucking whatever environmental air through that system from a humidity and moisture standpoint and mixing it with your sugar and adding it to, through your transfer lines and into your silo. So a number of folks have actually uh, gone to a system where they're providing dehumidified air. So hooking that hose up from the truck to some type of a unit that is dehum providing dehumidified air and using that type of air. Again, and a lot of people are using dehumidified air in their storage vessels or their silos. The key there is you want to maintain that headspace in that silo and, and, and uh, moving that air through there. You want to maintain that 50, 60 percent. I put a, a question here is, can my sugar be too dry? And the answer is an emphatic yes. One of the biggest issues that I've run across with a number of companies is I've gone in to take a look at why sugar is clumping up, getting hard in their storage silos. And they have they have done the great thing. They've used dehumidified air. Unfortunately, they haven't managed that air to the point where their humidity dropped well below the 50%. In some cases, I've actually seen it in single digits. And that promotes very, very hard sugar very fast. I've seen sugar go into silos one day, two days later, it was rock hard and was actually damaging rotary valves at the bottom of the silo trying to come out because the, the, the sugar crystals clumped up and became so hard. So if you're going to use dehumidified air in your silos, you want to make sure you maintain, have some way of managing that air between 50 and 60 percent relative humidity. You want to minimize exposure of sugar to environmental air. So once a delivery vessel, a rail car, particularly in this case, uh, has been opened and sugar has begun to be unloaded, continue unloading until all that sugar is unloaded. I've seen too many times where uh, plants will bring a rail car in open up the rail car, 
unload about a third of the rail car, shut it down, come back two or three days later, take a little more sugar out, close it down, come back a few days later. And then all that time, that sugar is sitting there and had been exposed. Rail cars are not hermetically sealed and it is absorbing moisture. So we've found, and our advice has been to uh, sugar users, once you open up a rail car and start unloading, if you can at all possibility, unload that entire rail car all in one at one time, whether it takes you four hours, six hours, 12 hours, unload that rail car. Do not let it sit. It will pick up moisture. That moisture will tra uh, make it difficult to get sugar out of that car. You'll end up leaving sugar in the car and it will affect the sugar that's in your storage system throughout your, your, tra uh, your transfer process within your, your organization. You want to maintain a working inventory. You know, manage your current inventory of sugar, particularly, again, this time of the year, a sugar by matching production demand to inventory supply to facilitate turning over of that sugar of the inventory regularly, striving for no more than a two- to four-day inventory turn. I found people to load silos all the way up, and then they run and they wait, and that's a good two weeks' worth of sugar, and they slowly get it down, and they start wondering why it's clumping on their walls, that type of thing. We've advised people, again, particularly this, particularly this time of the year, to um, you know try to manage your inventory a little closer. You want to have enough there for safety stock. You don't want to run out of sugar, but you don't need to have that much sugar sitting there on hand. It's just that much greater of an opportunity for sugar to absorb summer environmental moisture that's out there. Again, managing inventory during plant shutdowns. A number of plants this time of the year will take, say, a week or two week shutdowns. A lot of folks have asked me, well, should we run our sugar silo down? I said, absolutely, don't run yourself out. But again, it goes back to the less amount of sugar you have sitting for a, a less amount of time in that silo will give you a greater chance of not absorbing humidity from the environment and plugging up. So if you can, you know you're going to shut down and you know when you're going to start back up. Again, this is planned shutdowns. I would encourage you to run your inventories down as low as possible, get it out of the silo, maybe get a delivery sugar, not run it out maybe, but run your sugar down and get a, a plan to get a delivery maybe the night before, the day before you start back up again so you can get back into your cycle. But you want to be, as I always say, you want to be moving that sugar. You want to be moving that inventory through that silo quickly as possible. You don't want to be putting in there and letting it sit for two weeks. Again, uh, so we want to minimize the effects of immunity by managing particle size. We talked a little bit about that earlier. So when you're unloading, especially when you're loading nomadically, you want to maintain a maximum loading or transfer pressure of 10 to 12 PSI. We know that through experience, if you get higher than 12 PSI, a number of things happen. You're moving that sugar nomadically. First, you're generating heat. So it's heating that sugar up, which may end up may releasing that bound moisture that's been conditioned in that sugar. So again, that moisture has been controlled by the sugar manufacturer. It's bound, it's, uh, it's through a conditioning process. But if you, uh, if you expose that sugar to adverse conditions like very high heat, and you could start to release that bound moisture. And once the moisture becomes free form, it'll attach or accumulate to wherever it wants to, not in a stable form, and you'll end up affecting your flowability, maybe getting wet spots. Also, with a high pressure, you start fracturing those crystals. Again, so we're again we're cracking open that egg, releasing an, another type of moisture that's free to end up wherever it wants to, and then never ends up in the right place, in a good place. Fracture and abrading of sugar crystals. Abrading basically is as you're moving sugar through mechanical systems, through piping, you're basically rounding off the rough edges of a sugar crystal. I always say a sugar crystal, kind of, it's not like a ball bearing. It's not nice and smooth. It's much like a snowflake with a lot of thinner edges out to the outwards. And as you're moving that sugar through, you're basically knocking off those edges, creating many more fines, creating an excessive amount of fine crystals. And again, finer the crystal, the greater the affinity he has for attracting and absorbing moisture. So you want, again, these are three areas why you really want to make sure you're managing that pressure. If you're having um, a, a third-party carrier delivering your sugar by truck, um, or if you're managing your own system from a rail car where you're using air assist, you want to not exceed this 12 PSI because beyond there, you're causing damage to those sugar crystals. You want to limit the introduction of humidity moisture in the makeup air, unloading air supply. We, we mentioned that. 
we want to minim, uh, maintain dust collector efficiency. So uh, we got a lot of words here, but humidity will reduce effectiveness of dust collectors faster in summer months as humidity combines with the fine particles. So basically in the summertime, you get more humidity uh, on those cartridges or those sock filters. You're going to have more moisture. Sugar is going to collect on those bags much quicker. It's going to blind them over, and you're not going to be getting the effectiveness of that dust collection. So not only is that a, uh, a safety issue when it comes to combustible dust, but again, it's not absorbing those fine crystals. They end up uh, staying or falling back into the sugar supply. Now, again, once again, as we mentioned above, you're adding finer crystals to your mix, which are now have a greater affinity to grab that moisture. So this is all about managing that particle size. So you want to manage your unloading and procedures and practices. So assure that all your unloading procedures are consistently followed across all unloading shifts and unloading personnel. Uh, one of the things I've seen many times over the years where uh, either you have some new employees have just taken over a job, maybe on a second or third shift. you got a guy who's been doing it for 20 years. Now he's retired. Uh, that type of thing. You want to make sure everybody's following the same processes. I've seen it happen where uh, they have great written procedures, but the procedures are not necessarily followed uniformly, and that can affect the flowability of your sugar and the ability to get it out of your rail cars and affecting that crystal size once it gets to your silos. You want to manage, and one of the big areas is managing rail car vibrators to prevent their overuse. And they really should only be active when they're needed to affect flowability. I've seen too many times where people will put vibrators on rail cars, turn them on, and keep them on continuously while that sh sugar is unloading from the rail car. What that does, it ends up compounding a problem where it's that vibration is actually causing compression of sugar. And so it's not necessarily a moisture issue, but it's a compression issue as it continues to vibrate and it will affect, again, the flowability of sugar and decrease your opportunity to get all the sugar out of a rail car. Maintain all the mechanical aspects of the unloading process. So optimize the functionality of your unloading system by eliminating any leaks that might be in the system in the, pi in the piping to transfer uh, uh, valves and, uh, and um, rot rotary valves, those type of things, sifters. I've seen a lot of leaks in systems whereby if you get sugar coming out of those pipes, it's, again, it's not only an issue with uh, combustible dust hazards, but uh, now you're not utilizing your full vacuum. You're not moving your sugar appropriately. You may end up putting more pressure on it to try to account for that. And now you're damaging crystals. So all of that, one of the big things is go through your entire process, fix every and all leaks that you have in that process. Again, you're probably, if you have that, not only, again, you have a cleanup problem, you got sugar, your loss of sugar, and you're not moving sugar the most efficient way, and you could be affecting the crystal size, but ultimately, again, affecting your flowability and your moisture in your silos. And just, you know, A, B, C, D, it just keeps leading on to everything. So very big concern. I've seen a lot of sites where I've gone into where there's been a lot of sugar leaking through sifters, these pipes. You really should clean those up. You're going to be helping yourself big time. You want to review all unloading transfer lines to eliminate any sharp bends or 90-degree turns to, op to optimize pneumatic pressures and to minimize the production of fractured or small crystal sugars. So, again, what happens is a lot of these systems, you take a look at your how your systems have been engineered. You want to uh, reduce as much as possible any kind of turns, bends in your line. Straight shot to a silo is not always achievable. Sometimes you have to go vertical. Sometimes you've got to up horizontal, depending on where your receiving lines are and where your ultimate uh, storage site is. But if you have to make turns, they should be sweeps because every time sugar is pushed through piping, as we mentioned earlier, you're kind of abrading that crystal. You're knocking off little edges. You could be, as a result, not, you're not unloading fast enough, so you put more pressure on. And again, it goes back to the things we talked about earlier. About more pressure, what that can do to your crystals. So you want to take a look at how your, your lines are engineered. If you've got 90 degree turns, eliminate those with sweeps. If you can eliminate sweeps with longer sections, do that. Every time you go through a valve, every time you go through a, a, a bend in the line, you're abrading your sugar crystals to some degree, and it's all cumulative. So the more you have in, in your system to get to your silo, the more opportunities you have to create finer crystals to create more absorption of moisture. 
So those are really some of the keys we're talking about for, for summer months. It's really about managing those crystals and managing the air and the environment as much as you can. We're not going to control outside. We're not going to have airtight buildings, but the systems that we use, there's things that we can do to minimize the opportunity for the, that sugar to absorb that moisture. And we want to achieve the most flowability as possible. So we'll talk a little bit about ADF. ADF has been involved in a number of sugar projects. Uh, we've been installing some sugar systems in at different uh, food locations. And, you know, um, so ADF really has the engineer, has the engineering experience as well as operational knowledge uh, to, to be able to help with your sugar problems. If, if there's something that you, uh, that you need some assistance with. So ADF provides the expertise in the following areas to assist you in determining solutions to your granulated sugar handling opportunities. So again, uh, we know a lot about walking into somebody's facility and walking through your entire bulk sugar transfer and handling process, kind of taking a look at doing an assessment, comparing it to what we've seen in other locations around the country. What are some of the best practices that we can share and help you with those solutions, not only offer ideas, but then also offer solutions to you as well. Uh, we also offer a combustible dust hazard analysis. I always wanna bring this up when I'm talking about sugar. You know, uh, combustible dust has become a, a real watchdog on, on OSHA standpoint. There's been issues with combustible dust related to sugar as well as other ingredients, but sugar has really been kind of in the focus right now. And you really, uh, if you haven't done so, uh, there's actually, uh, OSHA has adopted uh, NFPA 652, which means by September 2020, anybody who's handling any kind of products, need it be sugar, flour, starch, whatever, any raw material that's creating a dust situation, you must have conducted a combustible dust hazard analysis. That's basically taking, you know, having somebody take a look through what are all the opportunities that might occur. It doesn't mean you have to have it solved by then but you will have to be able to present to them that you've done a combustible dust hazard analysis as something that, that ADF uh, uh, can, can offer as well. Again, it analyzes not only the type of dust, but the level of dust concentrations that would uh, come under the, uh, the regulations of OSHA, proposing and designing management and process engineering solutions. So whether it's, you know what, you know, we need to put together a better cleaning program, or you need to reroute this product, or you need to put in some type of uh, dust management system. ADF has been working with companies doing this very thing. So not only can we come in and say, here's where you need help, but we can show you how we can help you achieve those solutions. And we also can run uh, full analysis of granulated sugar systems ranging from sugar unloading, transferred, storage, stored conditions to final function use, something I've been doing for many, many years working with customers. Again, walking through from the beginning when they first received the product in the type of vessels walking all the way through their system taking a look at what best practices are out in the industry that might be applicable to your particular situation uh, we can do analysis of a uh, sugar upon receipt so basically comparing what you're receiving from your supplier on their coas we can do an independent test on those as well to to basically confirm what you're receiving or looking for any red flags of sugar, as I mentioned earlier in, in this talk about are there any attributes here that might lend themselves to, again, uh, causing some issues with your flowability, uh, smaller particle size, those type of things. Again, so then we can not only upon receipt, but then we can also take a look at sugar throughout your transfer system and determine where within your system maybe you're breaking down sugar crystals. I had a company I was at a few years ago, and they were having major problems with their silo. The sugar in their silos was clumping up so bad that uh, so we were able to take a look at different points along their receiving system from the rail car to their silos and found that halfway to their silos, because of the bends and the, and the pressures and their piping and the pressures, they were literally turning granulated sugar into powdered sugar. Now, powdered sugar now, you've fractured all these crystals, you've opened up all this moisture, created finer crystals, and they was absorbing moisture. So we we're able to uh, give them some ideas on how can they minimize the breakdown of that sugar before they got it to their silos. So in, 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 uh, to, to, in conclusion, I guess, I would say in retrospect, but in conclusion, um, ADF is positioned very well with not only background operationally and handling sugar and the technology of sugar, but the implementation of engineering solutions, taking a look at uh, existing systems, 
need to be modified or whatever to help promote uh, better sugar flowability and not only that, better condition of sugar being uh, making it to the receiving point uh, to prevent moisture pickup. Uh, ADF is, is perfectly uh, positioned to do that. So again, uh, you, please feel free to contact me if you've got any uh, other questions that I may not have touched upon today regarding any specific bulk sugar handling challenges for a free discussion to investigate the ways in which ADF engineering can provide you assistance regarding challenges. You know, again, you can contact me at, that's my email, rsmith at adfengineering.com. Or if you'd rather t take a look at uh, maybe ADF and see uh, not only how we can handle uh, sugar issues with you, but some of the other engineering capabilities, which we have quite a few to help you within your, your processes. Uh, if you want to take a look first at our, at our website, that'll give you an idea of what ADF does. And uh, again, I would welcome you to um, to give me a call. Uh, uh, first, I'm sorry, give give me a, an email. And it has my information to call me as well. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. So, in closing, uh, I, I thank everybody's attention. Love talking about sugar, as you can probably tell, and uh, would love to talk to you about sugar if, if you got any questions. So, uh, again, at some point, you can touch with me, and I open it up now to, if uh, there are any questions from anybody. Thank you, Ray. Um, at this point, if you have any questions, please use your control panel to send those to us via questions or chat. It looks like we do have a couple here already. So, uh, Ray, I'll open your line back up, and uh, you can step in here and answer some questions. The first is, okay. uh, what systems are most vulnerable during higher humidity other than intake? Um, the most, I guess, most systems. Again, when you're talking, uh, again, as, as we mentioned, piping systems such as sifters, such as the piping itself, you want to make sure you have a nice, tight, closed system, and any type of air that you're using in that system to move that sugar. So we're really, particularly talking about pneumatic systems, which I would say are the majority of the systems that are used out there. Anytime you're using any type of makeup air. Be careful of where you're you're pulling your air supply from. Either it be from the environment outside. I've seen companies pull air from internal systems where there was high humidity, higher than outside uh, uh, situations. So you really want to take a look at your overall system and wherever you might be pulling in uh, make what I call makeup air. That's what you, that's what's really susceptible is that makeup air. There's not much you can do in your silo itself other than controlling. Uh, humidity in silos, but I found that again, if you're managing your inventory of your sugar, you know, two days, three, four days of high humidity is not going to affect the mass of sugar. If that sugar is being put in, being pulled out at the same kind of the same rate, if you're moving that inventory through the silo, it's when you put sugar in a silo and a majority of it sits for a week or better, that's when you're subject to it. So, short of dehumidifying your silo, which m many, many people are not doing that. They're managing it through their inventory. Okay, thank you, Ray. And we have one more question before we sign off here, and that is, how can you manage dust collection in higher humidity? Wouldn't humidity dampen combustibility? Um, it, yeah, it, it does. Well, it, it dampens combustibility maybe for that sugar that's been affected by humidity. But again, if your if your dust collector is not performing as expected, and if you don't have a a, a process whereby, you know, in the summertime, a number of people will be checking their dust collectors much more often than than other times of the year, or if you don't, or if you maybe have some type of a, a monitoring system to let you know your your bags or your cartridges are plugged or or, or ghosted over, uh, blinded over. Um, if you're not pulling the humidity away, I'm mean, sorry, you're not pulling the uh, the dust away, it can actually cause greater problems because now you're not removing that dust and you're allowing it to build up to a concentration because it's not being pulled out of the area in which you've got the dust collected for. So as far as managing it, I have found most people the best way to manage it is just going to have to step up your PM program that you know kind of decide uh, through trial and error, taking a look at 
you know, how often do you need to replace those bags, clean those filters, whatever. Uh, it, it's a challenge for those few months in a, in a summertime. Uh, I'm the, I don't know of anybody having a dust collector system whereby you can control the humidity in the system. I, I suppose it might be possible, but uh, it's been more of a more of a vigilant thing, stepping up your PM, knowing that time of the year you're going to get caking or, or uh, again, blinding over those filters and may have to just change them more often. Okay. Thank you, Ray. And I think that wraps it up. We have no more questions. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, again, Ray's email is rsmith at adsengineering.com if you need to reach out to him. Thank you very much. Thank you much, everybody. Bye.